we had had this discussion innumerable times. Your father and I could understand this behavior when you were younger, but you are 13 years old now. You're a young man, and you should not have to sleep with all of these lights and the TV and the radio on. But, Mom... No buts. Now close your eyes and go to sleep. And I don't want to hear a peep out of you tonight. There. Now good night. I'm going to talk about the gin from a slightly different perspective. Uh, Pierre covered such wonderful ground this morning on some of the uh, connections between gin and ancient beings, including the angels and the gods. These are things I have explored myself. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to be focusing especially on the ET abductions and what is the role of the gin, because there is a role for the gin in ET abductions. Uh, what is that role and what does it mean to us? Not just in terms of abductions, but to the whole of humanity. Um, just to give you an idea of the scope of my work, um, Ben mentioned that I have written 59 books. Yes, people ask me how I do it. I don't know. I don't want to know. I just do it. Uh, but I'm fascinated by all of these things and how they are interconnected. And so my work over the past 30 years, and actually it's a lifelong um, project for me, lifelong. My work is my life and my life is my work. I investigate the paranormal, which includes ghost haunting, spirit attachments and spirit communications, UFOs and ETs, encounters and sightings. I'm particularly, I'm not so much interested in nuts and bolts aspects of it, but the human side of it. Uh, how do human beings experience sightings, craft, encounters with entities? What do they do with that, um, that information, with that experience? Cryptids, encounters with unknown beings. Some of these are mysterious creatures that seem to be combinations of things. And I'm also deeply involved in the metaphysical realm, spiritual development and expansion of consciousness. I'm a hypnotist. I do past life regression. I'm an energy healer. I'm a reader. I do psychic readings. And uh, I have had uh, many spiritual experiences with a variety of beings. Uh, including some mystical experiences, but especially I look for the connections among all these areas because everything is interconnected. No matter how far you go on the dark side or how far you go on the light side, you will find connections linking everything together. And so I've often described my work as uh, A to Z, literally angels to zombies and everything in between, and that's the truth of it. Well, I mentioned that uh, I'm especially interested in context. So uh, how do we find meaningful context in all of these experiences, regardless of whether or not we've had a scary experience in a haunted place, or whether we've had some mind-expanding, consciousness-uplifting up experience with a being of unknown origins? Uh, what do we do with that, and how do we explain it within the context of history? And I have found through examining these uh, anecdotal accounts and experiences 
that people have had the same core experiences throughout history. We have just put different labels on them. So what are we doing with these experiences and how do we keep advancing our knowledge of ourselves, the world, our place in the cosmos? And uh, where do we go from here? Because I do believe that we are at a major turning point in the evolution of humanity, in the development of our consciousness, and our sense of our place in the greater scheme of things. <clears throat> so let's focus in on jinn and ET. So what we're going to cover today is the road to the jinn. How did I get to the jinn and their role in this particular aspect of uh, entity contact experience? Who are the jinn? Uh, how the jinn interact with humans? And what is the search for meaning and all of that? So we're going to uh, cover a variety of viewpoints. And I certainly have my own opinions on this that I will share with you too. Well, my road to the jinn began with the shadow people. Now, I had been heavily involved in paranormal investigation about 10 years ago. And uh, what happens with me in my work is that um, I will often get uh, a flood of inquiries about something. And I wind up looking at experiences that are very similar, but yet they come from wi widely different sources and places. People have had no contact with each other and yet they are incredibly similar or even the same, and what does it all mean? So 10 years ago, in 2004, I had uh, what I describe as a mini tsunami of inquiries involving these beings called shadow people. Now, they've been known by many other names, and most of the time people don't even call them shadow people, but they were all the same, dark entities that uh, were terrorizing people, and they were very often bedroom invaders. People would wake up in the middle of the night and see these dark entities in their bedroom uh, who seemed to be very evil because they threw off an incredibly malevolent energy. People were terrified. What were they? Were they demons? Were they ghosts? Uh, what were they? And more important, why were they attacking people? So I thought, well, uh, this is interesting. I think I'll look into this. I'll interview people, maybe do some uh, magazine articles or a chapter or two in a book and uh, you know, move on. I'll put it into context with something. Well, little did I know that this would turn out to be the beginning of a 10-year search that is still going on because the tentacles from shadow people spread out in all directions. They hit every single area of work I have ever covered and even opened up some new areas for me. Uh, now, in my research, uh, I discovered uh, that shadow people have been dealt with in various forms, including the media. And I found a very interesting clip from the Twilight Zone that illustrates this kind of contact experience and the terror that goes with this. Now, this is from the 1980s Twilight Zone. And whoever wrote the script for this had probably been an experiencer himself. It concerns a young boy uh, who's in his teens and he's afraid to sleep in the dark because when the lights go off, a being comes out from under his bed and terrorizes him. Danny? Danny, I thought we had had this discussion innumerable times. Your father and I could understand this behavior when you were younger, but you are 13 years old now. You're a young man. And you should not have to sleep with all of these lights and the TV and the radio on. But, Mom... No buts. Now close your eyes and go to sleep. And I don't want to hear a peep out of you tonight. There. Now good night. Thank you. 
Okay. Well, when it happens to kids, adults dismiss this thing as the bogeyman. Uh, but it's more than that because adults have these experiences too. This is not imagination. This is something that happens to men and women, adults and children, uh, adults and children, all ages, and sometimes throughout life. So it is an experience that many people have. And what I discovered was that um, many people who were shadow people experiencers did not know that this is a very common phenomenon. They did not know they shared a similar, if not the same, experience with untold numbers of people. I began collecting stories, and um, uh, I did do an article on shadow people for Taps Pair Magazine. This is a magazine published by the Ghost Hunters team in America. And uh, here again, I thought this would end it for me, but it did not, because uh, once I uh, started talking about shadow people, the accounts started pouring in. And I have over a thousand of them today. I have them in a database, and they split out into core experiences and sub-satellites of experiences. They do not share all the uh, same phenomena, but there are similar phenomena that repeat from experience to experience. So uh, clearly something was afoot here with our interactions with beings in other dimensional realms because it did not seem to me that these were ghosts. Uh, I've had quite a bit of experience ghost hunting. Most of them are residues. Uh, they do not interact with people. These were some sort of sentient uh, being, very intelligent, very crafty, deliberately wanting to frighten people, yet they didn't seem demonic because there was not uh, the usual pattern of demonic deter deterioration in a person's life uh, once they come under assault by a dark entity. So what were they? I could not put my thumb on what exactly they were, but I could identify their characteristics. The typical shadow person is a male-like humanoid figure, six to eight feet tall. In fact, some of them are quite a bit taller. They almost always have on a coat or a cape, and sometimes with a hat. Uh, and it's always a strange hat, like a stovepipe hat, Victorian stovepipe hat, or a cowboy hat, or a, what we would call a detective fedora. Uh, it's always out of fashion, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, but I do have some ideas about why they do wear a hat. And sometimes they have uh, robes with uh, hoods or cowls. They are solid. There's very little detail in them. Uh, people rarely see things like eyes or faces or appendages. They're solid black. And yet they seem to have mass because they will block out light behind them. Uh, if they engage with people physically, people feel that they are in a tussle with a physical being, and yet on a moment's notice, they can vanish into thin air. They can go through walls, slide back under the bed, you look, there's nothing there, go back into the closet, there's nothing there, go up through the ceiling, out through the window, down through the floor, evaporating into mist and smoke, and away they go. They are almost always bedroom invaders, and yet I did find shadow people in other kinds of experiences as well, including daytime experiences. So here are some drawings from shadow people experiencers, and you can see that some of them will share similar characteristics, and yet none of them really looks uh, like a regular human being. They have a human-like shape, but it's often very ambiguous, and it seems to be disguised by this, what appears to be a garment they are wearing. Very rare to see things like hands or feet. That's quite common in entity contact experiences in general. <clears throat> now, sometimes uh, they don't have hats or capes. Uh, people will sometimes see eyes, or if they do not see eyes, they know they're being stared at very intently, and they will put eyes in their drawings because they want to illustrate this feeling of being stared at. Uh, there is almost always a hostile or malevolent intent behind these beings. Sometimes they are seen out in the woods. Um, I've been to uh, many areas in what I call portal zones where a lot of ongoing activity is occurring uh, over the course of long periods of time. And uh, these areas are po often populated by robed beings. You never see their faces. Uh, who are uh, gliding about in the woods, and uh, they do move extremely quickly. Uh, as I mentioned, they usually have no eyes. They rarely communicate with people. I have cases where they have 
uh, given messages to people, but uh, usually they are silent and that ratchets up the terror for people because when they show up without warning, nobody knows what they are, what they want, and why they're there. And that makes the psychological factor all the more scary for people. Uh, they go through solid matter, and as I mentioned, they often vanish into uh, thin air. Now, animals do not like them. Some of you who are familiar with the abduction phenomena are already seeing some patterns here. Beings that move through walls, beings that show up in the bedroom, create fear and terror. Animals do not like them, uh, vanish at a moment's notice, and are hard to uh, pin down, if not impossible to pin down, uh, as to who exactly they are. What's more, people who are regular experiencers of shadow people feel they have no control over this visitation. They come, these entities come when they want. They seem to have complete volition as to what they do with human beings, and the victims often feel at their mercy. They are frequently paralyzed during this experience. They cannot move or cry out. More connections. An obvious one, men in black. You've got these humanoid figures uh, dressed in what appears to be dark clothing and hats. Um, they are very good uh, candidates for uh, accounts of men in black who seem to be authoritative individuals who show up and harass experiencers and uh, threaten them not to disclose what they have experienced or seen. Uh, these figures act and move very strangely. Uh, some of them have a mechanical way of acting. There is always something weird about them, just like the shape-shifted jinn who can't quite get the human form right. Their hair is weird, their clothing is rumpled, something's out of kilter. Uh, they speak in mechanical ways, but yet they uh, communi can communicate telepathically. They always seem to know where someone is. Uh, they come with uh, a syndrome of phenomena like poltergeist phenomena, telephone disturbances, nightmares, dream invasion is very common from negative entities, uh, and uh, they can make life a living hell for experiencers. Gray Barker wrote about Alfred Bender, a man back in the 50s, uh, who uh, pub he had a newsletter and a reporting bureau, and uh, he said that he was going to reveal the secret of UFOs. Uh, well, three men in black visited him and um, evidently made a case that uh, he should not do this. And uh, Bender began to suffer all kinds of um, breakdown symptoms. He, his health deteriorated. Um, he had uh, these poltergeist phenomena outbreaks, felt he was being followed and watched and uh, within short order had closed his bureau, never published any secrets. Uh, other people, uh, during the Mothman uh, wave in the mid-1960s in the Ohio River Valley in America, uh, men in black were quite prevalent, uh, visiting uh, people who had seen Mothman or had seen mysterious lights or craft in the sky. In fact, the UFO ET activity really was what was going on in that wave. Mothman was only a minor player and uh, what was a huge outbreak of UFO activity. Men in black were part of that. So uh, just another iteration, in my opinion, of the shadow person slash gin. Now there is a vampiric aspect to this. I've mentioned that people suffer this wasting away. Well, in gin lore, they take the life force and they take it through blood and fear. And of course, we've had the long history of blood sacrifice to, uh, to gods and to higher entities. It is uh, still uh, well known in jinn lore today that uh, this is what the jinn really want from us. They want the energy from spilled blood. And um, so when people have unfortunate accidents uh, or there's war and carnage, the energy that is released from the shedding of blood is something that the jinn can make use of. And uh, they seem to do it through fear as well, that when they come, and uh, terrify people at night and do nothing but stand by the bed or be in the doorway and people are terrified, they're still giving off incredible uh, adrenaline uh, and um, adrenaline emotional energy uh, of fear that 
uh, these entities, I believe, um, can make use of, and that seems to be a purpose of it. When this energy is vampirized from human beings, then uh, people suffer. Their lives begin to fall apart if they are regular victims. Um, they suffer psychologically, a deterioration. Their life degrades, their relationship de relationships degrade. And uh, we see some of the same effects in, uh, in the ET abduction community as well. So aliens also, you know, they take the life force through genetic material, the abducting um, beings. And uh, then we have an interesting connection there through the Chupa Chupa uh, lights, which were uh, reported, uh, Jacques Vallée reported on them, uh, Bob Pratt did too. Uh, these uh, craft who appeared in various places in South America and uh, these red laser-like lights and beams would emanate from these craft and strike people, and uh, people would have wounds on them, uh, people died, uh, their health deteriorated, uh, supposedly they experienced an uh, unknown loss of blood like some of the exsanguinated, uh, mutilated animals that are associated with the uh, ET activity as well. So there's um, a vampiric aspect to the negative side of these encounters as well across the board, connecting the two of them. Okay, the search for meaning. Um, what sense do we make out of all of this? Well, uh, just taking a, a few examples from uh, some of the experts uh, across the board, uh, trying to put a good spin on it, seeing it uh, as something very horrific for people, uh, John Mack wrote about this in Abduction, and uh, he uh, did not believe that it was anything uh, imaginary or any sort of mass hysteria. It was a genuine phenomenon. Uh, but he saw it as, uh, as positive for humanity as a whole. And uh, many of the people that he interviewed and some of the ones that he profiled in his book Abduction saw it uh, as well, that despite the horrific things that were happening to them, uh, they were uh, players in, in something uh, very good that was happening. Uh, many abductees would be hard-pressed to agree with that when uh, their lives have fallen apart on them. So Max said, I would not say that the aliens never resort to deception to hide their purposes, but that it is, in my view, too narrow or linear interpretation. We may be witnessing something far more complex namely an awkward joining of two species engineered by an intelligence we are unable to fathom for a purpose that serves both our goals with difficulties for each. And uh, for many that might seem to be too simplistic, kind of a, a Cinderella, rosy uh, glass, uh, eyeglass look at it. Uh, but yet uh, there is, I believe, some truth in this. And uh, unfortunately, Mac is uh, no longer with us to explore uh, the developing angles in the abduction research. I would like to know we, what he would have to say today. And he went on to say, we have only sketchy knowledge of what the hybrid program, which seems to lie at the center of abduction <coughs> phenomenon, is really about. Yet my overall impression is that the abduction process is not evil and that the intelligences at work do not wish us ill. Well, I do disagree with that. I think that we do have some ill-wishers uh, in the mix there. Again, we can't look at an explanation that is all black or white. We can't try and pigeonhole it into something that is all good or all bad. Uh, there's a huge gray area in between where I think a lot of agendas and motives are colliding. Jacobs uh, saw it as, uh, or has seen it rather as, uh, something that is quite negative. It's a breeding program uh, to create hybrids that have an extended ability to stay on Earth and that these are infiltrating the planet. Uh, well, you could uh, certainly see that in uh, some of the uh, jinn motives, that if uh, the jinn um, wish to uh, come back into this reality uh, in a greater way and they are incapable of staying in this reality, uh, manifesting in form for very long, then a hybrid would certainly offer a lot of advantages to them. Uh, it does go much, much beyond that. Well, Valet uh, has examined this from a variety of perspectives as well, and in some of his works he, he sees uh, the more positive angles uh, to the abduction phenomenon, and uh, by the time we get to confrontations he's seeing a lot of hostility involved, that 
this is not imaginary or extraterrestrial. Uh, this is an advanced technology with hostile potential. Uh, I do believe that there is an extraterrestrial component to it, but that largely we are dealing with interdimensional beings, beings that really are associated with us right here on the planet. John Keel, who wrote about the Mothman wave and a lot of other uh, phenomena, uh, had the view that this is all trickster. Um, this is uh, always hostile to people. It's, it's like uh, a big uh, circus playground of stuff going on that we have no control over whatsoever. And that every time we try and get close to an answer, the phenomenon with a capital P just shape shifts on us and uh, we're left with more questions than answers. So uh, where do we find some, um, some traction here that we can start to make sense out of all of this? Uh, well, I, I see three possible scenarios, and one is, okay, there's a takeover. Uh, the the Jinn, uh, they do want hybrids, and uh, they want to uh, be able to resume their, their place on the planet that uh, was said that they had before we came along. They just shapeshift uh, to maneuver around us and uh, cater to, to our beliefs, what we're willing to accept, what we're willing to tolerate. Uh, and that uh, the ones that are dealing with us really just want us out of the way. Um, many people do uh, favor this scenario. Scenario B, um, manipulation. Um, not quite so dire. It's they're entertaining us at their own expense. Uh, they want to seduce and possess us in order to have physical experiences. And they're just involved in big chess games. And that they do have a role in politics, war, and conflict. Now, a couple of years ago, I was uh, asked to do a paper uh, for a book on the role of the jinn in the Arab Spring, and uh, were the jinn behind um, some of the, uh, not some, but were behind a global conflict. And uh, it's an undercurrent that um, you don't see publicized very often, but it, the undercurrent is there, the assumption that, yes, of course, the jinn are involved. Uh, politicians uh, sell out to them, they make uh, deals with them for power, uh, and that they're really like the arms merchant. They really don't care who wins in a conflict as long as there's conflict because that's what benefits them, the complete upheaval and disarray of humanity and, uh, and the feeding off of that. Uh, and you could certainly uh, see that um, formula play out in history, if you want to apply that to other historical situations, you could certainly see that as well. So that's uh, one particular scenario. The Black Death uh, would be an example of that. Then there's another scenario. They really are strange allies that despite all of this negative emphasis, these horrific experiences, uh, maybe they have a really different role that we haven't considered, and that is to force us to face fear and to come to terms with the interdimensional Earth and with our multidimensional selves. Uh, they might even be monitoring or moderating the roles of, uh, of other entities. Uh, we have no indication for whether they're cooperating with other entities in the abduction <coughs> scenario or they're competing with them. What role do they have? Uh, maybe it's a, a moderating kind of effect, and maybe they are really instigators of transformational change. Now, uh, what we find in the abduction literature over and over again, uh, the people who have had the really long, serial, horrific experiences where their entire lives have been torn apart, uh, there was always this search for the high note, like what sense do I make out of this that I can come out of it for the better? This can't just be about um, you know, my destruction and uh, the destruction of other people. So we have to consider this angle and it actually has uh, merit to it. Uh, now I don't think that it's a case of any one of these scenarios. There's probably a mix of things going on because as I've emphasized the the jinn uh, have a variety of motives, just like human beings do. You wouldn't describe all human beings as terrorists, but yet there are terrorists among us. You wouldn't describe us all as bullies, but yet there are bullies among us. And uh, even among the jinn and jinn lore, uh, there are enlightened jinn, um, jinn who feel very neutral to us, 
some of the ones who have communicated have said, uh, well, they don't feel ill toward us, but we're a lower life form, so they, they don't want to be involved with us. Uh, but um, we're getting a skewed end of the spectrum with the ones that are acting out in a hostile way. But maybe it has some sort of higher purpose in a bigger scheme of things. So we have to consider this possibility if we're going to make any sense out of what is going on. We have to stop looking for black and white answers and we have to stop looking for <coughs> external villains in this case. Uh, so there's an alchemy to this about entity contact. And now alchemy is the process of transmutation from the impure to the pure. And uh, you may be aware of uh, stories from uh, uh, earlier centuries where alchemists attempted to change base metal into gold, that there was some magical formula that would take the impure from the earth and turn it into the pure. And from a spiritual perspective, there is uh, the path of spiritual alchemy that we are all on in life, that uh, life is about purifying ourselves and attaining something higher, more expanded consciousness, uh, a greater awareness uh, of who we are and where we fit into the scheme of things. So that is the goal of enlightenment. Now the only way you get to the gold is by going through the darkness, and that is the first stage of alchemy, which is like a cycle, uh, that there is a complete destruction into blackness through chaos and things coming apart before the process can begin to, uh, to recombine things and to reformulate uh, into the, the gold uh, of enlightenment. This is uh, a formula called the Philosopher's Stone, which um, this is from alchemical art. Uh, this is called the Emerald Tablet, which was supposedly a stone that contained the magical formula for this transformation process. And uh, I had um, a lucid dream one night uh, that reminded me of the Emerald Tablet in which uh, a being, uh, and it's a God the Father kind of figure because of the triangular halo around it, uh, came and showed me a symbol for truth. Uh, now I'm a tarot reader, so this was couched in tarot symbolism. You know, everything's within context to personal life. Uh, and this was like an additional uh, card to the tarot deck, and it was called Truth. And um, it's a pyramid of actually seven layers with a flame coming out on top. And uh, bears uh, some sim similarities to this triangular-like emerald tablet, the formula for um, perfection with the flame. Uh, the solar flame uh, coming out on top. And that I was shown this as this, that this was a symbol for truth. Well, symbols have a way of acting on our consciousness. They're like shorthand. They contain much more information than you could ever describe in writing. They activate consciousness in a certain way. And so I felt I was being given this symbol as uh, something that really pertained uh, to my work and to a lot of the things that were going on that uh, this was an alchemical process, the search for truth, the soul search for truth, uh, and that it has many layers, and um, that sometimes we need to look between the layers to find the answers. So what do abductions really reveal? Well, uh, maybe they reveal that we have a need to heal a tremendous split in the collective uh, human psyche. Uh, and that this is really a coming to terms of our own wholeness on various levels. And how do we do that best? Well, it might be through going through the dark side, as anyone who has gone through trials in life uh, will attest that's sometimes when you make the most growth and the most advancement. So what may be happening now in this particular um, outplay of engagement with these beings is that uh, we are uh, collectively confronting um, dark side fear and, and questions that we have to grapple with in order to expand our consciousness uh, beyond the physical realm. Uh, we have to come to terms with fear and also with the fact that uh, we share this planet and this cosmos with other beings and that that key to transformation is really consciousness. So nuts and bolts, 
looking for external factors, those are, those are all part of the picture, but they're not the whole picture. We're not going to find the answer just in hard evidence of landed craft, uh, bodies of aliens, uh, conspiracies, and things like that. We are going to find some answers, but we're not going to find them all. And the key to it really is how do we transform our consciousness in the face of all of these experiences. So the way out really is the way in. And I think that's one of the most significant things of these experiences that uh, seem on the surface to be so troubling, so horrific, and have such a long stretch of uh, playing out over human history that uh, that is uh, the light, the top side of them. We have to shift our perspective if we are ever going to get a handle on it, if we are ever going to get answers to some of these uh, troubling questions about our engagements with other entities. But uh, I just want to give you uh, a few examples, and these are, are just the highlights because the examples are all over the abduction literature of people who have had repeated abductions and uh, engagements with shadow people throughout their entire lives, even before the abductions actually begin and begin to take force. So uh, the jinn seem, seem to be heavily involved uh, in this particular aspect of human entity contact. So uh, beginning now, Ann Druffel, uh, Scott Rogo is uh, no longer with us, unfortunately, very good researcher. I did talk with Ann Druffel. She's one of the few uh, researchers who uh, was very aware of the presence of shadow people, didn't know exactly what to make of it, um, but she considered it to be an important part of the uh, abduction um, syndrome. And uh, the Tahunga Canyon contacts in the Los Angeles area go back to the early 1950s. And uh, some descriptions just uh, from the accounts of the, uh, the victims. Strange lights show up. Now, they were uh, given uh, pseudonyms in the book. Uh, the abductions begin with strange lights appearing and then shadow figures that manifest outside and come inside. Uh, they appear on the lawn. They pass uh, straight through the glass. Uh, and um, in this case, uh, they are the, the abductors. I found very few cases where the shadows themselves were the abductors. They usually preceded or followed. And uh, these accounts were given under hypnosis. Shadows, like shadows in the room, they're moving. The shadows are moving. Yeah, they're coming across the lawn and into the house. They're so, so shadowed. It looks like they're wearing almost like a black ski mask. But the whole thing is black and just their eyes are out. What are all these figures? The hall, they're between the bedroom and the kitchen. These people, all these dark figures, you can't see through them, but they're very much like a shadow. They're not transparent at all. Uh, case after case like this of what is clearly the shadow person phenomenon occurring to people who wind up being taken by uh, what we describe as aliens. And uh, Bud Hopkins has uh, some examples. Bud Hopkins did not want to deal with this question. I attempted to talk to him about shadow people, and he dismissed these figures as unimportant. They weren't unimportant uh, enough not to include in his book, but he didn't consider them relevant to the abduction phenomenon. Uh, and, and yet we, we learn about the young children in Intruders who are plagued by a bogeyman who comes out of the closet. Uh, short, big-headed, a glow around its head, uh, comes out of the bedroom wall, out of the closet, and communicates uh, via telepathy, just like a lot of shadow people experiences. And uh, another case that he mentions concerning um, a man who had missing time. Now, he's, this is a man who's related to an abductee, but he also has missing time during uh, a hunting trip. And after that missing time experience, uh, has two shadow people experiences. Um, one, uh, these two figures appear in a pair outside the cabin. And then he has another, like, complete freak-out experience where he's driving in his pickup truck uh, early in the morning, and he sees something in the rearview mirror, and it looks like uh, a silhouetted man wearing a hat. Uh, and he sees it very clearly in the mirror. It's like someone jumped into the cab with him. Uh, and uh, he was so startled that he, he pulled off to the side of the road and turned around. Nothing was in the back of the cab. 
he was uh, so frightened that he jumped out and uh, ran off and uh, waited a while before he would even go back to his truck. He did not want to drive the truck again. He sold it. Um, so accounts like that um, follow in the wake of all of these abduction experiences. Whitley Strieber, uh, who described in uh, communion this powerful fear, the same sort of fear that shadow people experiencers um, uh, have as well, fear that's so profound it, it goes beyond description. A couple of examples from 1985, again, the light in the yard. I was looking into the far corner of the bedroom where I saw a dark shape about three feet tall standing in the shadows. I saw something that looked like it had a hood on it. My memory was of seeing the shape sweeping across the room and realizing with a feeling that galvanized my whole being it was something totally unknown to me, glaring at me from right beside my bed in the dead of night. And uh, then he reported another uh, figure about the same height uh, in the bedroom. I could see perhaps a third of this figure, the part that was bending around the door so that it could see me. Uh, this is another characteristic of shadow people, that people, uh, the victims, will uh, see these dark beings kind of bending around a doorway uh, as though they're fluid. Uh, they don't want to quite reveal all of themselves, but they just want to uh, peek around. It had a smooth round hat on with an odd sharp rim that jutted out easily four inches on the side. Could not see the face. When it was close to the bed, I saw two dark holes for eyes and a black downturning line of a mouth that later became an O, part of the whole syndrome. Well, going deeper into the darker side of it, uh, David Jacobs has explored the hostile intent of uh, ET abductions and has uh, descriptions with them that he has collected uh, from experiencers as well, but never putting it into context with a shadow person uh, uh, jinn uh, presence. Uh, it's like these beings have been entirely under the radar for us, and yet their presence is everywhere like pebbles on a beach. I have had people remember figures that look like Abraham Lincoln wearing a stovepipe hat, men wearing fedoras, angels, devils, and so forth. And uh, his explanation was that these were really aliens, uh, and the abductees were, just didn't know it. They were unaware. And so they explained their experiences in terms that made sense to them. And I think that's often how we, we grapple with our entity contact experiences, that uh, we, we have to put them into context with our time, our culture, our worldviews, and uh, in a way that makes sense for us. Uh, but actually, uh, we're probably dealing with these same entities all along, just in different guises. So Jacobs is saying that, well, you know, people say they're all these things, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really these aliens who are, are out to uh, create these, these hybrids for uh, purposes that really are working against us. He also said that, uh, and this is something he recovered from um, con or abductees under hypnosis, Aliens must be from planets in the known universe because they do not talk of time travel, parallel dimensions, or alternate universes. When they give impressions of their home environment, it is often a desert landscape. Well, I thought that was very interesting because uh, the jinn originated in a deserty environment and they are known to like subterranean areas, caves, and uh, remote and lonely places. Uh, so uh, the jinn do not communicate with us. Uh, I do believe that uh, they have um, access through parallel dimensions, probably through time. Um, in fact, um, uh, I did some study for a while with a, a Taoist exorcist. Uh, they have a very unusual take on the spirit world that I thought uh, would be enlightening from the perspective of jinn it was. <clears throat> And um, it's acknowledged uh, in that system that these entities do time travel and they will follow your thoughts through time as well. They will latch onto your thoughts and follow you into the past and uh, even form pathways into the future. Well, another thing that uh, I found interesting in Jacob's work was the personal project hybrid. Um, that uh, this involved entities who uh, formed a contract with their human subject and that the contract started from childhood, probably even before that because uh, uh, as Grant uh, Cameron was talking the other day about soul contracts, 
Uh, we probably have engagements with entities that precede this lifetime and uh, that they are an unfoldment of lifetime-to-lifetime uh, lifetime, uh, kinds of um, uh, relationships, uh, good, bad, or neutral, with, with a lot of entities. Uh, but the hybrid um, ages along with the human being. Now, I found this in shadow people cases as well, that um, when people were serial experiencers of shadow people from an early age, um, these beings sometimes became uneasy playmates, uneasy in terms of they were kind of frightening to the children, but they became almost companions. They were always there, and especially if children were lonely or neglected or they grew up by themselves, um, you know, without a lot of siblings around them, um, these beings took the, the place of, of companionship and aged along with the child uh, until the human became uh, of sexual age, and then the relationship shifted to much more of a sexual nature. So the personal project hybrid then has sexual relations with the human for the purpose of this reproduction, and may be jealous of other relationships that the human has. I did find this in shadow people accounts as well, that uh, when people tried to form romantic relationships with other people, the entity that was attached to them would do whatever it could to break that relationship up. We find a very interesting corollary in the concept of the Kareen in Jin Lor, uh, which is a lifelong companion, a romantic partner even for human beings, uh, very similar to daemons and uh, daemonists and guardian spirits, um, and that this is an entity that could be good, bad, or ambivalent. They're not you know, nothing is either all good or all bad. And uh, people have often asked me, are these beings evil? Well, I don't like to use the term evil. They are hostile sometimes. Uh, but if you have an enemy or you have somebody that you feel is working against you that doesn't, um, and you're going to work against them, that, uh, that doesn't make you evil. It just makes you hostile and makes them hostile. So hostile is a much better term for some of these activities. But here again, we have a very interesting parallel to this concept that has surfaced in abduction uh, research. So are hybrids ET or Jin, or are they one and the same? Uh, I began to wonder, uh, are we just dealing with a single entity that shapeshifts into myriads of forms, or are they in a much bigger mix? And I have uh, interviewed people all over the world uh, on this subject, and uh, the jury is really out. Uh, some researchers are convinced that the gin account for everything, um, they've just gone from one form to another. It was fairies 100 years ago. Now it's, they've figured out uh, we're interested in ETs, so they're ETs now. It's all gin. And then others who say, no, they're just um, working in a much vaster mix of things. My own feeling is that we are dealing with um, various uh, life forms, uh, entity forms, and that the jinn are among them. But how, uh, how much they account for our activities remains unknown. First of all, we, we haven't even known to identify them as a player on the field. And uh, so we have no data, uh, no extensive data to indicate the extent of their role in this phenomenon. So uh, just a summary here of some of the parallels uh, between the shadow people experiencers, shadow people being jinn and ETs. We have the bedroom invasions, paralysis in bed, uh, this electrical presence to these entities. Uh, they come through. Uh, solid matter through the walls, yet they can dematerialize in an instant. Um, penetrating stairs uh, from entities. Uh, this was, um, uh, has been, I should say, reported uh, in all of these kinds of contact experiences where the entity uh, seems to control and manipulate the human by staring deeply into the eyes and uh, literally penetrating the mind. Um, te telepathic communication is uh, usually the course. Um, manipulation of thoughts as well. And uh, this goes across the board from shadow people to unfriendly, unknown entities, uh, the jinn, and now into the ET abduction arena. So um, I, I was uh, 
particularly struck by the frequency of accounts of this, uh, this like blue light around these entities, whether they were described as abducting ETs or as shadow people or as both. And uh, as we can see, many of these experiencers get both. They get the shadow person and uh, the abduction. Uh, now, for many of these people, it starts very early in life, and uh, the early shadow people experiences will be at quite a young age, and often explained away by adults as the monster under the bed, the monster in the closet, it's just your imagination. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, the abduction scenario uh, might set in. Now, not everyone who is a shadow person experiencer is an abductee but there is uh, a very significant crossover between the two. So I, I came to the conclusion that uh, the jinn probably have uh, multiple purposes involved and that it's not all a uniform thing. Uh, they don't all do the same thing. Uh, we have the sexual involvement, lifelong attachments, uh, assaults that are difficult to pre prevent, and this interest in the occupation of Earth. Uh, or the manipulation of human beings. Well, there are other connections, too, that bring these entities together, and one is through the reptilian form, because uh, many abductees and uh, contactees um, who have other kinds of engagements with beings we call ETs uh, perceive them in reptilian form, which, uh, as uh, we've seen earlier, is uh, one of the favorite, most frequently taken forms by the jinn, the reptile, and uh, the connections also uh, to the, uh, the angel and god realm as well. Um, the reptilians usually, for abductees, uh, they will uh, often show up uh, once somebody is in, in um, the alien surroundings, like they've been abducted and taken supposedly to uh, what seems to be a craft, and that's uh, uh, where some of these beings will be encountered. Uh, many of them are cloaked, uh, they wear hoods to uh, disguise uh, their features, sometimes the features are revealed, uh, and they seem to be in charge. Uh, Jacobs had some descriptions of them, taller beings with leathery reptilian-like skin, huge liquid eyes, um, and uh, that they do mental manipulation on people, performing mind scans, and that they seem to direct these, uh, these smaller beings, the greys. Uh, reptilians, uh, one uh, abductee described uh, seeing the reptilian as he frequently wears distinguishable coverings such as a white, gray, or black lab coat, smock or robe. Sometimes abductees report that he is wearing something on his head like a hat or a surgeon's cap. Again, very interesting parallels to the shadow person form of jinn. The jinn uh, might even account for some of the insectoid uh, forms that abductees encounter. Uh, this is, uh, comes from a case I had where uh, this involved a man uh, who was experiencing abductions and, uh, but he said there were a lot of other things that happened too, uh, in addition to the abduction. Sometimes he would just be visited by entities who seemed to have the only purpose of showing up to, to instill fear in him. And uh, the being you see here was not an abductor, but would show up looking like, uh, he said it, it looked like a, a cross between a, a, an insect, like a cricket, uh, and a bird. It ha had, um, uh, what would be the, the wing area on a, on a cricket had a hard metallic look to it. It had a beak like a parrot's beak, um, forearms and hands almost human-like, and uh, then these insectoid-like uh, lower limbs. And uh, it literally filled his doorway, would show up as a bedroom visitor. This being was always accompanied by three small shadow people who were robed and had uh, red eyes. The three shadows were maybe three feet tall and emitted a buzzing sound, much like welding aluminum at very high amperage. They floated and hovered and circled me. Uh, the man said that the small beings terrified him more than the huge cricket thing uh, because of the energy that they, uh, that they radiated. Well, if the jinn were made out of smokeless fire, well, what is their true form? Uh, if, if we always 
uh, see them in some sort of horrific way, some sort of monstrous way, and they're shapeshifters. What are they? Nobody really knows, and the jinn really aren't telling us either. Uh, they are the masters of many forms. Uh, I have um, identified them in cases of ghosts and spirits. Uh, they have that blurring with the angels. Uh, human beings, very strange looking human beings, they can show up just literally as pillars of smoke and fog. And uh, they often have this connection with this electrical uh, field of energy through blue lights, glows, and uh, even an, an ele a palpable electrical field. Well, in old lore, their most uh, favored form was that of the snake or the reptile. And, and we find um, many references to that in the ancient literature. Uh, in modern terms, uh, they also show up quite a bit as phantom black dogs, the spectral black dogs. Now these are all uh, kinds of mysterious creatures that often show up in conjunction with waves of sightings and UFO activity. None of these things are isolated, they are all interrelated. So um, the uh, spectral hound is uh, another form of theirs. Most often they like to take forms that disturb human beings. Uh, things that should not be, combinations of characteristics that jolt people and uh, even terrify us. We could even make a case for some of the famous mysterious creatures we have encountered uh, in recent times, Mothman being one of them, a winged humanoid, uh, always shown with head, but actually Mothman had no head, just two what appeared to be red laser-like lights set in the shoulder blades, all weird forms that the jinn would be very fond of taking. Uh, here's a drawing from uh, northern Pennsylvania a couple of years ago. Uh, it's difficult to say, and the experiencer did not know whether this uh, thing on the back was uh, a set of folded wings or some sort of weird looking cape. Uh, this entity has been seen quite a bit in a certain active haunted corridor in Pennsylvania. They might even account for dogmen, entities that are combinations of humans and wolves or dogs. Here's a, uh, an entity from um, the Appalachians called the Grave Robber, another combination of creatures, a pig, an armadillo, uh, and uh, an alligator-like snout. They're called Grave Robbers because they, they like to uh, hang out in cemeteries and uh, dig up graves. And there are uh, when I'm talking about these entities, I'm not talking about sightings from 100 years ago. I'm talking about uh, everyday people who run into these creatures uh, all the time. And uh, they are part of our mysterious other dimensional world that we live in. This is from a case that I had in Florida, uh, an experiencer who was... Um, uh, she had had all kinds of gin experiences, abductions, um, sentient orbs in her house. Um, and she was plagued by this entity for a while. She also was certain that it was Jin, who would show up as a young man in just very bizarre looking attire uh, with these uh, kind of boots that were undone, uh, tattered clothing, uh, fingernails that were more like claws, and a sawtooth grin. Uh, and even though the figure didn't, uh, it doesn't look that threatening in the drawing, whenever this entity would show up, uh, she would be absolutely terrified. We can uh, see the djinn in the latest iteration of shadow people, the black-eyed kids and adults. Uh, these are human-like entities with solid black eyes and saw teeth uh, that, um, just like the vampire of old, want to come into your house. Uh, will knock on your door and come into your house, and uh, if they manage to get across the threshold or to touch you in any way, you become ill, you have bad luck, bad fortune, all kinds of horrible things happen to you. These have been reported since the 1980s. They probably go back earlier than that, but um, those are some of the earliest cases we've been able to document. I think it's just the latest wrinkle in a very old phenomenon. And uh, we can certainly see this uh, weird shape shifting in the moon eyed people. This is from Native American lore in the Appalachians. It's supposedly a weird race of beings that lived in remote areas in the mountains that preceded uh, people. Now, this interesting uh, example came from uh, a Jin experiencer who described the being as a mass of moving 
uh, lines of energy that would coalesce sometimes into skull-like forms and human-like forms. And uh, the description was, I saw a metallic shape right in front of me. It was shaped a lot like bismuth, bluish-green, angular, and opalescent. It starts to bend and twist almost organically of its own accord, and a deafening, resonating hum begins to fill my ears. Uh, in uh, many cases of shadow people and also ET abductions, we find the experiencer uh, has uh, an electrical uh, feel um, around them in the air. Uh, their skin tingles, the hair rises up on their arms and neck. Um, they hear uh, buzzing, humming, and ringing in their ears. I think my, my own interpretation of this is that these are uh, phenomena of transdimensional shifting going on. Well, the jinn can also appear in very exotic, alluring forms, especially when they want to uh, seduce people. But behind their allure, uh, there was always this, uh, this dark form. And um, there are many cases on record where the jinn will start out in a very attractive way, and uh, then they show some of their true self, whether or not it's their true self, but it's almost always ugly, and it's, uh, it's used sometimes in a way to keep people in line. Uh, these are cases where um, the jinn have formed uh, almost companion-like attachments to people, and if the humans displease them, then they, they uh, show up in a horrific guise. Uh, I found a very significant connection between jinn and fairies, uh, to the point where you could say that fairies are jinn. Uh, they have uh, almost identical origin stories about um, being here before humans, uh, that they were pushed out of their place because of humans. They have similar supernatural powers. Uh, and even though we think of fairies as friendly little wing things a lot today, our ancestors had an entirely different view of them. Uh, there many, many of our ancestors from uh, Celtic countries, including uh, right here in the, in, uh, the UK, viewed fairies as dangerous beings. You did not want to cross them. They had their own territory. Uh, the fairies didn't like people, and so you'd best steer clear of them. And the same beliefs apply to the jinn as well. Uh, the fairies will haunt. The jinn will haunt. Both of them uh, are interested in uh, abduction. Uh, they both will possess people. And um, there is a history of uh, sexual engagement with fairies for the creation of hybrids as well. So we find very interesting crossovers among all these areas indicating that um, we're probably just dealing with different forms of the same kinds of entities. Uh, here are some other uh, similarities between jinn and fairies. Uh, and that uh, when you run afoul of them, you start to suffer. Your health suffers, you have bad luck. Uh, they have this tricky nature, you can't really trust them. They have their own agenda going, and yet they share the planet with us. Uh, I was very struck with uh, some of the similarities between uh, the evil character uh, in <coughs> Leprechaun and the Jinn movie Wishmaster. Both of these came out in the 1980s, and they act in almost identical ways in terms of hostility and manipulation uh, toward human beings. Now, Wishmaster is, uh, in my opinion, the only Western film to be made uh, to date that really portrays uh, a, a an interesting picture of the jinn. You know, they're not genies in the bottle, they're not silly little things, they are dangerous beings uh, who uh, manage to come through interdimensional portals and have agendas against people. Very good movie. Wishmaster 2 and 3, not good. Wishmaster 1, very good. Well, the E.T. fairy connection has been explored at length, so here we have more cross connections. Uh, we've had a thorough examination of the similarities between many cases of uh, ET contact experiences and the similarities to fairy lore and even descriptions of beings that are called ETs but looks, look like they could come out of a fairy book. This is from the uh, mid-1950s case in Kentucky where uh, a silver disc came uh, out of the sky, landed uh, near a farmhouse, and these goblin-like entities came out and cavorted about in circus-like fashion all night, uh, thumping around on the roof, peering in windows, uh, doing somersaults, terrifying the residents. Uh, bullets went straight through them. Um, they make an escape and bring the sheriff back, but the entities pull a disappearing act. They're gone when the sheriff arrives. And then they leave just as suddenly as they came with no explanation. 
very uh, similar to accounts of fairy engagement, and yet we, we've called them ETs. And uh, so we have now the cross connections uh, between the, the ETs, the fairies, the jinn and the fairies, and uh, so we can only assume that uh, the ET forms are not beyond the interest and ability of the jinn, and indeed uh, they are involved in ET abductions. Well, I found in examining uh, the shadow people literature, uh, just looking for patterns, that um, a high number of uh, people volunteered that they were also ET abductees. I thought that was quite interesting uh, that there would be so many uh, reporting both kinds of experiences, far more than I would expect just uh, at, at random. So uh, I went back through my uh, database and uh, sent out new queries, and I now include uh, ET information in my uh, questionnaires as well, uh, and found even more accounts of, yes, I've had both, uh, even starting from early in childhood. So uh, if um, uh, the jinn are involved in ET abductions, well, are, are they just uh, shape-shifting into these aliens? Uh, do the shadow people have a role in that? Because if people are experiencing shadow people and ETs, what's the connection there in this hidden form? And uh, there is a specific role that shadow people, jinn in their shadow person form, seem to have in the ET connection. They don't seem to appear uh, during the abduction as much uh, as before and after. Uh, this is uh, a phenomenon that seems to have escaped notice in the abduction literature. Nobody really paid much attention to it. Well, I interviewed uh, abductees and uh, investigators as well. Uh, Stan Romanek is famous for his uh, shadow people experiences. Uh, here's a photograph that uh, he, he says uh, he captured on one of his uh, surveillance cameras of a shadow figure poised outside of his uh, bedroom door. But he said that um, he also sees them during the day and throughout the house. Um, he described them as being having kind of a, an electrical, almost mechanical nature to them. But they are part of the abduction phenomenon. Well, I thought if, if these shadow figures, if Jin is shadow people, are involved in abductions, then uh, we will find evidence for it in the literature. Uh, and this is just a very small sample. I went back through the abduction literature. These are just a handful of books, uh, some of the better known books. But I went back through uh, rereading the accounts <clears throat> and uh, finding the presence of shadow people everywhere. And yet they, are never, they never seem to be taken into any sort of significant account in terms of their relationship to the abduction. Um, I tried talking to abduction researchers with mixed success. Um, people either uh, were familiar with shadow people but didn't want to deal with it. It was just unimportant. It was just another one of those things that happened to the victims. Uh, or they were not aware of it at all. Uh, and so it was a real mixed aware of the jinn, uh, having studied magic and uh, the history of sorcery and the ancient alien uh, mysteries, I was aware of the jinn, but I hadn't really factored them too much into my own uh, current work uh, because they just seemed to be in the backdrop of things. But I discovered uh, as I followed these leads that they were not in the backdrop at all. They are very much at the forefront of things and very, very well hidden. I came to the conclusion that shadow people are jinn, that this is a form that uh, is well suited to these entities uh, and enables them to carry out this stealthy behavior uh, where their true identity is disguised in order to pester, molest, and torment, and that they do have hidden agendas. Now, it seems like I'm going way into a dark side of things here, and yes, there is that element of it, but it is very purposeful to look at this side of things because there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, now, Pierre, this morning, uh, went into uh, a wonderful um, 
uh, examination of the connections between jinn and angels and the ancient gods. And uh, I found this as well. And uh, I also found them uh, playing in, in different guises uh, now in different ways with human beings. So they have a very long history of dealing uh, with us. So who are they? Well, let's uh, look at some of the other aspects of them. Uh, we often, th when we think of the jinn, if we think of them all in Western culture, it's usually a, some sort of Middle Eastern thing, and they look kind of demonic. Uh, now, they are not any more uh, confined to a region or a culture of this planet than fairies are. You would not say that fairies only belong to Celtic countries. Fairies are everywhere. Ghosts are everywhere. Uh, mysterious creatures are everywhere. And it is true that um, much of the lore and knowledge about the jinn uh, originated in and developed in the Middle East, but that does not make them a Middle Eastern thing. So Westerners cannot dismiss this entity as something that belongs to uh, a certain group of people. Uh, these entities affect all of us. And they come in different guises. Their name means the hidden ones. And in the lore about jinn that uh, go back to uh, the times of ancient Arabia, they are pre-Adamic. They were beings that were here on the earth, supernatural beings. They are said to have very long lifespans. Uh, they are definitely supernaturally empowered, and they are quite the superior shapeshifters. They can mimic any form. They can look like human beings. They can look like mysterious creatures or animals, spirits. Uh, they will uh, mimic ghosts. Um, they seem to have a propensity and primary interest in molesting and manip manipulating people, including using us as food sources. Uh, sometimes they have a sexual interest in people, and this also goes way back to ancient times, and they are very well known for being vengeful when wronged. Um, they live in uh, invisible realms. They are invisible to us most of the time, uh, but if we manage to uh, upset them, they will strike out against humans. Well, this is a pattern of uh, activity that applies to some entities that we are very familiar with in our culture as well. Uh, so the jinn are not, the, we're not dealing with gingerbread cookies here, you know, cookie men. They're not all the same. We have a tendency to look for black and white when it comes to uh, these areas. We want to know this is an apple, this is an orange, this is a ghost, this is that. Uh, they're all bad, they're all good, but the jinn are not. In a sense, they are like human beings. They are as varied as us in temperament, motive, agendas, behavior. Uh, however, it seems that much of our interactions with them, at least the ones that we're uh, most dramatically aware of, uh, fall on the negative side, the manipulative side, but they are deeply embedded in our entire human history. And in the Jinn Connection, uh, I talk about re-examining uh, all of our ancient alien god and demigod experiences from the standpoint of Jinn that beings that we have called the Anunnaki, the, Arch, uh, the Archons, angels, uh, the hybrid gods of, of Egypt and the Middle East, uh, all uh, the Nephilim, the Watchers, they all have connections to the jinn. And of course, uh, we heard a very good case uh, on that this morning. So the jinn really hide in plain sight. They are the hidden ones, and yet they are everywhere, and they're below our radar. So we don't always realize that we are dealing with them and not with something else. So let's look at that list again. Here are all the things now. This goes beyond shadow people. If shadow people are jinn, then the jinn are involved in all of these things. <clears throat> and that gets us uh, into uh, other areas of uh, entity contact experiences as well. But for us, uh, we re only really know about the jinn through old folk tales that uh, were originally oral stories and uh, comprise a body of tales called the Arabian Nights, or the Book of 1001 Nights. And uh, many stories of uh, these jinn beings uh, in these tales, uh, which were not translated for a Western audience until the 1700s and widely distributed, uh, the term jinn became known as genie, and that's how we often uh, think about them. Uh, genie is the singular for jinn. I use the term jinn for both uh, singular and plural for the sake of uh, convenience. Uh, but uh, the translation of jinn uh, became genie in some of these translations. Now, 
uh, Sir Richard Burton, who uh, did one of the most authoritative translations into English uh, of the Arabian Nights, uh, believed it was uh, important to keep the original uh, term, uh, which he did. But mo for most of the rest of us, they just became genies in the bottle. Uh, however, the ancient world knew them very well, and uh, including this historical figure, there's now enough evidence to say that uh, King Solomon, the son of David, second king of Israel, was a historical person. Uh, king Solomon, um, according to uh, ex-canonical text, had intimate knowledge of the jinn. Now, he is credited in the Bible with building uh, the Temple of Jerusalem, even the city of Jerusalem, in order to ha house the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and the Bible talks about the construction of this temple, but doesn't say who built it or exactly how. But the Testament of Solomon, which is an ex-canonical text, talks about how Solomon enslaved the jinn to do it. Uh, now, when uh, Solomon got the throne, God asked him what he wanted, and instead of riches and power, he wisely answered that he wanted knowledge and wisdom. God was very pleased and uh, gave him uh, the ability to discern and control all spirits. And so he used this power to enslave the jinn in order to build the temple. And uh, in some translations of this text, they're called demons, uh, but the ancient world really knew them as jinn. This Magical wisdom of King Solomon became the bedrock of our Western mystery and magical uh, tradition. The Solomonic magical lore uh, formed the basis for what became handbooks uh, of magic uh, to use in the summoning of spirits for various purposes. So the jinn are very much with us in that regard. Now, interestingly, King Solomon, uh, there's a story that one of his concubines uh, was half jinn. In the ancient world, uh, there was a belief that hybrids could be created between jinn and human beings. And these hybrids would have the physical characteristics of people, but the powers and presumably the allegiance of jinn. So here is the Queen of Sheba coming to the court of uh, King Solomon for the first time. The story goes that his advisors were so worried that she was going to control the king that uh, they devised a test to reveal her true identity. Supposedly, the jinn have imperfections. In the lore of jinn, they, when they shapeshift to people, they uh, cannot shapeshift perfectly. There's something that gives them away, the shadow people with the misshapen heads. Uh, and one of those characteristics was uh, hairy feet or legs. So um, the stories are that they either um, put water down on the floor of the temple or they uh, put uh, like a crystal-like substance that would look like water on the floor so that as she approached the king, she would have to lift up her skirts and reveal whether or not she had hairy feet and legs. Um, there are also different versions to that story that uh, because she was jinn, she knew in advance she, uh, what, what they were doing, so she shaved her legs, got away with it. Uh, but at any rate, she remained uh, a concubine for a while, had a relationship with him, and then uh, supposedly he sent her home with a bevy of jinn to serve her uh, at the end. But we find stories like that continuing into modern times where people are reporting uh, sexual uh, congress with beings that they have identified as jinn and that there are hybrids somewhere uh, as a result of that uh, that are taken into the jinn world. Well, the jinn were absorbed into Islam. Uh, they predate Islam. Uh, the Quran has numerous references to them, even an entire chapter in the Hadith. Um, which are commentaries uh, and accounts of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, also make numerous references to the jinn. Uh, and according to that creation story, uh, there were in the beginning angels who were <clears throat> created out of a pure spiritual light and jinn who were created out of a smokeless fire. And uh, then God decided to uh, create humans out of earth and uh, water, and that's what created a lot of problems. So the angels were instructed to bow down to Adam, uh, but the jinn uh, did not. And Iblis, who was the leader of the jinn, who was in heaven with the angels, refused to do so. Now his name means despair, or he who is despaired. And he said that he would not bow before humans because he considered them to be inferior, and why would he do so? Now there's a lot of ambiguity between angels and jinn. 
Um, and a lot of debate as to whether or not the jinn were angels. And there's incredible blurring between those lines. Uh, the jinn are supposedly not angels, but yet they're in heaven at, uh, along with the angels. And uh, there are never any clear-cut demarcations. But at any rate, uh, Iblis refuses to do that. And so uh, this angers God, and he casts the jinn out. They appeal, and he gives them until Judgment Day to make their case that human beings really are inferior. And so the cast-out jinn then become uh, like the fallen angels. They retreat to another world, which in modern terms could be called a parallel dimension attached to Earth, uh, where many of them seem to remain committed to tormenting human beings. But I, it's a much bigger picture than that, because uh, the jinn um, seem to be um, in pursuit of their own agendas. They have some of their own um, self-centered purposes as well, but they also might be playing a greater role than uh, we could suspect. So this division of the interdimensional boundaries, I believe in an interdimensional Earth, that uh, we have uh, a planet that we share with many kinds of beings, and most of the time we don't see them because they vibrate at a different level uh, than we do, and yet there are these doorways and experiences that pop open and we have encounters with them. And so it becomes like a very thin doorway where there are uh, pushes and pulls on either side uh, for access. And sometimes we want them to come in, we do a summoning, and then with the jinn it's a case of pressing against our, our own barriers to have access to us. So what is it that they really want? What's really going on here? And uh, how are we uh, involved with them in the greater scheme of things? That's a question that I think we can find some answers for in the abduction arena. But we have not had a, a, a clue as to how to approach that yet, because it goes back to how the jinn are involved in Western culture. We don't know them other than these genies in the bottles and lamps. They never really entered our mythology or our folklore or our daily experience. Much, much of the rest of the world is quite familiar with the jinn, and yet um, many people have never even heard the term uh, or dismiss it as uh, something that really doesn't pertain to them. They have been portrayed in our fiction, our film, our television as silly, funny, quirky, not to be taken seriously. Uh, it never really goes much beyond this uh, with the genies. Uh, we have uh, depictions uh, from films. Uh, again, you know, the exotic creature that is more fantasy and imaginary uh, than actually real. Uh, it only appears out of bottles in order to grant wishes, uh, materializes, this is from the Thief of Baghdad from the 1940s, materializes as smoke, and um, uh, then uh, is obliged to grant wishes to human beings as, as thanks for that. The wishes never go very well, by the way. First one goes well, second one does not. Third one is usually uh, wish to uh, undo uh, uh, the other wishes. So we have this idea of the jinn as something purely fantasy instead of incorporating it into our entity lexicon like we have even with, uh, with the fairies. Uh, very good special effects for the 1940s. Uh, but, you know, if it wasn't, you know, the jinn belonged to the realm of flying carpets, and, and that was it. That's been it with us. Well, it's, it's really a different story, because meanwhile, they are out there uh, engaging with us on the